What is going on guys? In this video, we are gonna be talking about the decorator pattern in the context of software design. And I'm gonna be referencing a lot of material from this book, which is Head First Design Patterns. And this is a very, very useful book in terms of understanding design patterns, just because it presents the content in a very easy to understand, relatable way with some very practical examples. Uh, so if you're interested in picking up this book, I'll put a link in the description section below. And also I've done a, a bunch of other videos on design patterns from this book. In fact, we're going to be doing videos on every single one of the design patterns. Uh, the previous ones I've done are on the strategy and observer pattern. I'll put those in the description section below for you to check out. Um, but in this video, we're going to be talking about the decorator pattern. So in terms of the content of the video, I'm going to just define the decorator pattern as per the definition of this book. And then I'm going to talk to you about conceptually why it's a useful thing and some of the alternatives that you can use instead of the decorator pattern. From there, I'm going to run through an example on how we would solve a problem if we're not using the decorator pattern. And then from there, I'm gonna show you comparatively how you would solve the same example using the decorator pattern. So you get an understanding of how it works in real life and some of the power and advantages that it brings over not using the decorator pattern. Uh, so that's what's in store for this video. So let's start out by quickly defining what the decorator pattern is in the context of this book, Head First Design Patterns. So the decorator pattern attaches additional responsibilities to an object dynamically. Decorators provide a flexible alternative to subclassing for extending functionality. So let's pick this apart a little bit and kind of demonstrate what it actually means. So typically when you want to add additional functionality to a class, you subclass it. You just extend that class and override some of the functionality that was defined by the parent class. A uh, classic example, if you're learning OOP, object-oriented programming, is typically you have an animal class, which is the super class, and then you have a dog class, which is a subclass of the animal. And then you know you have a speak method on the parent class and you override that in the dog class. So when the dog speaks, it barks. Whereas if you have a cat subclass, when the cat speaks, it meows. This is typically how you would do uh, subclassing in terms of adding additional functionality. And where the decorator pattern is different is that it relies more on composition as opposed to using inheritance like we saw here. Uh, and I'm gonna get into more on like how composition works throughout the remainder of the video. But the, the main idea, the main takeaway of the decorator pattern, uh, kind of my TLDR for this thing is that by using the decorator pattern, you can impersonate a class and add additional functionality to it without any of the users of that class actually knowing that it's any different than the real original class. That may be a little bit confusing for you, but we're gonna go through an example shortly and just kind of demonstrate how this works. Now, a common place where you'll see the decorator pattern out in the wild is the java.io.inputStream class. So if you're interested in seeing an example as it relates to the Java SDK, go and check that out. You can see a whole bunch of different examples of it. So now I wanna move into kind of talking about how you would solve a problem if you're not using the decorator pattern. And the theme that we're gonna use in this video is the idea that we're trying to build a system to compute the cost of beverages for a coffee shop. Okay, so we have a coffee beverage. We have different types of beverages. There can be you know, dark roast, light roast, espressos, lattes, all sorts of stuff like that. These all have different costs associated with them. And then you can have different condiments or different things that you add to the coffee that can make it cost even more. So things like cream, things like almond milk, things like sugar, all those kinds of things that you would typically add to a coffee. Uh, so let's kind of diagram this out a little bit. I'm just gonna kind of do a little rough draft of how this example would work out if we're not using the decorator pattern. So just reiterating, this is not using the decorator pattern in this uh, example I'm about to draw out. Okay, so let's assume that we have a coffee class here. And the coffee class super type has two main attributes. It has the cost of the coffee and it has the description, description of the coffee in terms of what it is. Now, if we want to add different beverages now, like this is the super type, right? We don't really have a, a concrete implementation of coffee. Uh, for every beverage that we have on our menu, whether that be espresso, dark roast, light roast, latte, anything that we can think of, we now need to subclass coffee so that we can implement the cost and description function and kind of override that behavior. So what would that look like? So we would have like espresso down here, 
espresso we would have like dark roast i'm just going to put dr for short and light roast lr for short and then what do we we need to do now well espresso needs to extend coffee and then it needs to override the cost and description function uh, the same thing needs to happen for dark roast the same thing needs to happen for light roast so so far this is making sense there's nothing really too insane about this we just have kind of subclass types for each drink and then they now just need to override the functionality for each of these different attributes now where this starts to get a little bit murky is if we introduce another concept say we introduce the concept of ingredients ingredients and now um, we have additional costs based on these ingredients kind of like i was alluding to before so maybe we have things like cream that costs i don't know some amount uh, milk and sugar you know, these things don't typically cost anything when you go into a coffee shop, but maybe some of them in the more gourmet ones do. But, you know, you can quickly extrapolate this if you have more expensive ingredients that actually do cost a lot. You can easily see how this would be applicable. Things like, I don't know, like almond milk or like agave or any of the fancy things that people put in their coffee drinks these days. Um, so the question is now, how do we incorporate this ingredients concept into this relationship so something that kind of sticks out on my head is that you would introduce a concept of like ingredients so like a list of ingredients ingredients sorry my writing is a little bit uh terrible there uh and then each of these different types of ingredients so cream milk and sugar would be a different uh implementation they have a different cost associated with them as well and then when you're kind of building this espresso object you add like you know 2x sugars uh, 2x sugars obviously no milk or cream for espresso should never add milk or cream to an espresso uh, and then in your dark roast you can do things like you know 2x sugar 2x sugar and then maybe like 1x milk right and then you can potentially um, just compute the cost function based on considering the base cost of the dark roast plus the sugar plus the milk and then in the end that's what your cost is uh, so there's nothing wrong with this approach this is kind of the classic uh, inheritance type way to do this uh, the problem is that you're going to get a class explosion as you add all these different ingredients add all these different uh, types of beverages it can, tends to get a little bit complicated there but i just want to kind of tell you there's nothing inherently wrong with this let's go through the same exercise using the decorator pattern and where the decorator pattern is different is that we're going to use composition and some clever type matching tricks using abstract classes in the Java language to basically impersonate the coffee class and do this in a slightly different way. And this is going to make sense to you in a second here. Uh, so let me just scroll down here so I have all the class diagrams that I want to draw out. Okay, so just a, a little bit of a warning here. It may be a little bit confusing in the beginning, but I promise you it's going to make sense once you kind of look at this from a big picture perspective. And it'll make even more sense when you look at this from the code, because I'm going to walk you through how uh, the code actually is constructed once we're done with constructing these classes. So using the same example, let's walk through what happens here. Uh, so we still have this coffee object, so coffee object. And this thing, again, is going to have still a description. I'm just going to put DESC and coffee. So it's going to have these two attributes and maybe some accessor functions that go along with it. Now, in this example, the coffee class is going to be abstract. No one is going to actually be instantiating an instance of this coffee class. It's just going to kind of be the template in which the subclasses need to, to use as their specification. Uh, so from there, we're going to have one subclass. And I know I mentioned like light roast, dark roast, espresso, lattes, all that kind of stuff in, in the previous example. I'm just going to simplify it and just use one type of drink just so you can get the idea. But just know that this applies to all different types of drinks that you may want to add. So let's say now we have this espresso beverage, espresso, right? And like I said, you can have like dark roast, latte, all the different types here if you want. Now the espresso um, beverage, it has a different base cost. And espresso tends to be a more expensive drink, so it has a different base cost because it requires a little bit more manual work, requires espresso beans, everything that goes into it. So its cost is going to be different um, let's say the espresso base cost is $1.99. That's what an espresso costs. A latte can be $2.50 or 3 bucks. You can add anything to any different types uh, that you want. But the espresso's cost is $1.99 in this example. And the espresso is going to implement the coffee abstract class. So implements, implements. Okay, that's looking good so far. 
Um, now, what we're gonna do next, which is kind of the interesting part, is that we're gonna introduce this concept of the decorator. And we're gonna introduce something called the coffee, coffee decorator. Decorator, hopefully don't run out of room. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, and what this class is gonna do, it's gonna impersonate coffee. So it's actually going to implement coffee, similar to how we did in the espresso, implements. But what it's going to do is allow us to add ingredients dynamically. And that's what these two boxes down at the bottom are going to represent once I fill them out. So the coffee decorator is also going to be abstract. So we're never going to instantiate an instance of coffee decorator. However, you can tell like since it implements coffee, it matches the same signature, right? It is still considered a coffee object. So this thing isn't gonna really have any interesting properties. It's just gonna be used for some clever type matching magic that we're gonna do in the actual implementation. So let's scroll down a little bit and hash out the next two classes here. So from there, we wanted to introduce this concept of ingredients, right? So let's say that these two boxes here are gonna to correspond to the two ingredients that we're gonna use in this example. So we're gonna create a class called with milk, with milk, or you can even just call this milk if you want. And then we're gonna say with sugar, with sugar. And for all the ingredients that you have, you can add additional classes here uh, for this as well. And what we're gonna do here is we are additionally, like milk costs extra, that was a kind of premise for our example. Uh, so let's say the cost of milk and the cost of sugar can be slightly different. Uh, so the cost of milk, I don't know, like let's say it's like 50 cents and the cost of sugar is gonna be uh, 25 cents, right? And these two ingredient classes are going to implement the coffee decorator. So the with milk and with sugar are going to implement coffee decorator and the coffee decorator implements coffee. So with sugar and with milk classes are going to be of type coffee, but through this kind of relationship chain that we've built here. And this is a little bit confusing if you're just looking at this from the kind of class diagram perspective, but I guarantee you this is gonna be a little bit more clear once we actually define the classes and show you how it works. But the basic idea here is that now when we construct an instance of our espresso, let me, let me just try to draw out uh, an espresso drink. Wow, that looks terrible, but you know, you get the idea. Uh, say this is an espresso, espresso, E-S-P-R-E-S-S-O. Uh, we're gonna have a base cost of 9.99, and then we're gonna add additional things to it, things like milk, milk, and then we're gonna add sugar to it, sugar, and these things are gonna cost differently. The milk is gonna cost 50 cents, the sugar is gonna cost 25 cents, but this is all gonna be dynamic. We're not hard coding anything here. We're gonna give the user the ability to you know, define the base class, sure, but dynamically add all these ingredients and we're gonna compute the cost function as the sum of all of the different ingredients and the base espresso in this example. So for, say for instance, in this example here, you know, you'd have $2 plus 50 cents plus 25 cents. So your total would be 275. Uh, so that's the idea of the decorator pattern. It allows you to do this stuff dynamically and compose your object at runtime. So that's the main idea of the decorator pattern. Uh, I, I realize this may have been a little bit confusing if you're just looking at this for the first time, but I promise you when we jump into the ID, which I'm gonna do right now, this is gonna make a lot more sense. So let's go ahead and do that now. All right, guys, so here we are in my IDE. I took the liberty of creating all the classes that we need for this example and set up the relationships in the way that we just described on the Blackboard uh, and also use the auto diagram building functionality of the IntelliJ IDE to just generate a class diagram of the classes that we're gonna use in this example. So I'm gonna leave this section down here up so that you can refer to it and just kind of anchor yourself to what we're talking about when we go through each of the classes. And just as a reminder, I'm gonna leave a link to this code down below so that you can check it out and play with it and just kind of learn by example. So let's run through all the classes that we have here by using this diagram as a reference. So we have coffee at the top, and if you recall, the coffee class is an abstract class. It contains the description, and it also defines a cost function, which is abstract, since coffee is abstract in this case. So it is enforcing that all of the subclasses need to uh, define their cost function. 
So if we go to the espresso class now, which is a subclass of coffee, we see that public class espresso extends coffee and its default constructor just sets the description to espresso, which is good. And we said that our cost for an espresso, our base cost at least, is $1.99. So this is all seeming pretty sane so far. Now I mentioned that the decorator uses kind of a trick in terms of interfaces and type matching so that your ingredients can impersonate objects. So we see here in the coffee decorator, uh, the coffee decorator, and this is kind of where it is positioned in this relationship, it's an abstract class coffee decorator that extends coffee. So coffee, coffee decorator is coffee. Uh, and it's saying that you must override the get description method. Now remember in the coffee class, we have the abstract uh, cost function, which means that anyone that implements the coffee decorator now needs to implement both the get description method and the cost function. So now let's look at how that works. So we have the coffee decorator, then we have the with sugar and with milk. So with milk, what does this thing do? So this is a little bit interesting and this is really where the magic happens of the decorator pattern. So with this class, we're saying with milk extends coffee decorator. So right off the bat, we know that we need to override get description and we need to override cost function, that's for sure. And the trick with this class, this subclass that extends the decorator is that it keeps a reference to the parent coffee object that it was called upon. So we're holding a reference here to a coffee object and we're saying whenever with milk is called when the constructor is used, we need to take an already existing coffee object. So you would use espresso in this case, since that is kind of your base object. So now we're holding a reference to it. Now, if you take a look at the implementation of the get description and the cost function, this is where the magic happens. So we say we return the coffee is get description function and we also append milk to it in this case so now we're saying the object now contains an additional property which is milk and we're doing something similar with the cost function you can see down here uh, we're referencing the coffee container instance using its cost function and remember in this case the the coffee's cost is going to be espresso so it's 199 and then we're adding our own cost so milk in this case costs 50 cents and you can see if we go over to the sugar class, it's basically the exact same thing. The only difference is that we are saying sugar and we are saying our cost is 25 cents. So this is the general layout of the decorator pattern. So this may have been a little bit confusing, but let's actually go to our main class now, which is our runner and test this out a little bit. So I have a couple different examples that are laid out for you. So I'm just gonna undo some comments so we can work through each of these examples one by one. Uh, actually, let's leave the second one here. And we just have this helper function down here, which just prints out the cost of the uh, beverage and the description, just so you can see what is actually happening. So in this first example, we are saying coffee espresso is new espresso. So what are we expecting to see here when we print out the coffee's uh, description and cost? Well, we should see 199 and it should be espresso. So let's run that now and see how this works. Great, and we can see over here that the cost is 199 and the description is espresso. Okay, perfect. So the espresso has the right properties associated with it now. So let's take that same espresso object that we just created and then let's add some milk to it. And then we're gonna print the coffee um, object as well to see what the cost is and the description says as well. Recall that if everything worked correctly, milk costs 50 cents and the base cost of the espresso is 199, so it should be uh, 249, and we should see in the description that milk is present as well. Let's give that another run. And you can see the cost is now 249, and the description is espresso and milk. Perfect, so everything is working correctly. Now we can do the same thing and add two sets of sugar. So let's run this again with two sets of sugar. So you should see the cost increment by another 50 cents. So you see now it's 299. And if we scroll over here, we can see that now we have two sets of sugar. So this is the decorator pattern. This is all there is to it. Again, just to recap on everything that we talked about, the decorator pattern is a pattern that favors composition over inheritance. So you can compose your objects at runtime as opposed to defining them through subclasses like we saw in the first example at the beginning of this video. If you enjoyed this video, I have other videos on other design patterns from this book. Check out this one on the right here on the strategy pattern. And I'll put a link to where you can get the design patterns book at the bottom of this video. I highly recommend you check it out. It's a really great read. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. Thanks so much and I'll see you next time.